Hello and welcome back to Rage Gaming and more Dragon's Dogma and things you didn't know. There is obviously a huge amount of depth to this game, a lot of sort of things to appreciate. This series aims to draw attention to them, but a big thank you to everyone on the first two episodes who left comments for ideas for the videos, it's been very appreciated. With that said, let's get started. We're kicking this one off with a cool and useful one based entirely on the mod by Philly Perimos. It's called Clear Effect Descriptions and it appears to me that there's been some kind of data mine to get this real information and then the mod has created a mod to apply these raw details to descriptions of things in the game. For us specifically though, we're looking at this list of augments for each and every vocation to find out what they actually do rather than say the base vague terms that they provide. Like sustainment here, it augments the physical defense and magic defense of the pawns in your party. Great, but by how much exactly? How valuable is this truly? I'd like to know so I could actually make informed choices. Though I'm going to try to be quick about this because obviously there's quite a lot. From top to bottom then we start with a fighter. Metal actually boosts your physical defense by 30 30% plus 45. So the more physical defense you have, the better it is. Provocation gives you 100% chance or likelihood of being attacked by foes. Thu actually increases the carry weight by 10 exactly. Dominion allows you to lift up and pin foes for two extra seconds. And Diligence hastens recovery by 0.3 seconds when down and one second when crawling. For the Archer, we have Ambusade. Increases damage dealt by your attacks by 10% when the targets aren't battle ready. Endurance increases max stamina by 150 points exactly. Radiance causes is the lantern to consume 33% less oil and obviously it illuminates twice the area. Lethality increases damage dealt by 5% when striking a target's vitals. And avidity enables you to clamber up cliffs and scale foes and other surfaces 10% faster. Next we have the mage. First we have this one that increases your base magic defense. This is also by 30% plus 45. Beatitude increases the amount of health recovered by curatives and curative magics by exactly 10%. Intervention reduces the duration of dehabilitations on you by 30%. And then this one extends the duration of enhancements and invigorations by 20%. Finally, Exaltation augments your stamina recovery by 10 per second. So an extra 10 per second. Next up, we have Thief. Subtlety decreases the likelihood of being targeted by 15% compared to the 100% opposite of Fighter. Gratification restores health by 4% when you get that killing blow. Poise reduces stamina consumed when struggling in a foe's grip by 20%. Vigor reduces stamina consumed when clinging or pinning down by 15%. And then Verve, very important, augments your strength by exactly exactly 30. So an extra 30 strength. Next we have Warrior with Vitality. This increases your max health by 200 exactly. Impact improves your ability to push and pull targets by 50%. This one improves your ability to break through an opponent's guard by 30%. Domination augments your total knockdown power by 15%. Some of these numbers are so much bigger than the other ones. And then we have this last one, reducing culmination of the loss gauge when receiving damage by 5%. Next up we have the Sorcerer. Aspirity increases the likelihood of inflicting dehabilitations with your attacks by 20%. Stasis reduces the rate at which your items deteriorate by 25%. Constancy augments your knockdown resistance by 30%. And then we have increased your damage dealt by 5% when exploiting a hostile target's element weakness. And then much like the Verve Strength one, we get extra magic stat by 30 in this case. For Mystic Spearhand, we have hastened movement speed by 10% when carrying or lifting. Increased gold obtained by 5% from the pouches. This is one I wanted to know. The augment from Polarity gives you an extra 5% strength during the day, an extra 5% magic by night. It is not taking away strength or magic at day or night depending on which it is. Refulgence increases the amount of rift crystals obtained by 5% and athleticism is reducing the stamina consumed while dashing by exactly 10%. For magic archer we have sustainment. Physical defense and magic defense of your pawns in your party goes up by 30. Veracity recovers 10% stamina when you deliver the killing blow to a target. Prolivity increases the likelihood that smaller targets will drop items by 20%. Ascendancy augments strength and magic of pawns by 30. And lastly we reduce the amount of time taken for fallen pawns to revive by just one second. Now we're on Trickster. Detection does what it says. Then for Enlightenment, we have 15% chance more of creating one or more of the resulting product when we're combining. Next, we decrease the likelihood of being beset by hostile targets when we're camping or in ox cart by 65%. So that is massive. Next, we decrease the likelihood that hostile targets will detect you when you're not in a battle stance by 15%. And then alert enables you to get that extra affinity with people by 10%. So not a massive amount in that specific case. And finally, we have the Warfarer. Zeal reduces stamina consumed by 5% when we're using these weapon skills. And then with this last one, we reduce the amount by which weight affects your movement speed 
by one bar. Meaning the bottom left, we have the weight there. It gives us an extra bar worth to avoid heavy or very heavy. And that's all of them. I feel like I've just said many words very quickly. I hope that was useful. Next up, we have one from the comments. So thank you to Joshua McCoy for the simple, and you know, in hindsight, pretty obvious trick. Let's say you're in town like I am now and you want to pass time. Maybe I need it to be night for, I don't know, a specific side quest or something. So I can go to a bench and sit on it, pass time, and boom, we're at night. And I didn't have to go into the innkeeper and, in this specific case anyway, spend 2,000 gold each time I want to pass the time or give the 24-hour reset. Obviously, let's say I want the 24-hour reset. I want to go to noon. Let's say it's currently the middle of the day or something and I need to skip time. Cool, I've skipped time. It's now kind of hitting morning so let's skip forward a little bit okay now we're at noon where i kind of want to be let's say i've just killed a bunch of monsters and i want to reset the day many many times and i don't necessarily want to spend thousands and thousands of gold to do that repeatedly well then yeah again benches are great and so you might be wondering at this point yeah cool you can use benches to skip forward a little bit in time that can progress things like stuck quests or you know skip to a time that you need or help you reset the world Yes, obviously. But as you can see, as I'm doing this repeatedly, it takes quite a few goes to get a full 24 hour reset. What if I'm waiting for a monster that's not gonna come back for three days or seven? Doing this while free is slow as hell. And maybe I've not spent all the gold to have a house in this particular city, so I don't have a bed to do a full 24 hour reset for free. Well, the tip from Joshua McCoy is to abuse the stand with ox carts. And again, it feels so obvious in hindsight. Basically, you have a bench next to ox carts and that skips you forward in time a little bit, but to get specifically to ox cart function time, that's gonna take you to the next morning. So if I wanna skip forward a full day to the next morning without spending any money, when I don't have a house, without spamming the bench multiple times, I can use this bell at the ox cart, no problem, for completely free. So I've just skipped a full day there and now I've just skipped a second full day. Let's go for a third time now. And with that, I have skipped forward 72 hours and potentially maybe something I'm hunting or enemies that are respawning are now back and ready to go. It cost me absolutely no gold, even though I don't have a house in this town and it saved me loads of time compared to using the bench method. It's just a smart way to use this and in every city you're gonna have an ox cart so it's available in the most important places. Next, we have a really neat one in my opinion. I'm standing in this specific place in Bak Patel for a reason, because it's the first place you meet Ragal, that interesting side character. As you come to this bar or the inn in Bak Patel, you're gonna be accosted by some ruffians and Ragal is gonna help you out. He's gonna tell them that it's not very fair. Why don't you do a 1v1, giving you much better odds. Now you meet him again later in the border town. You're told by some guard from the Vernworth city, they need help protecting an important person. You look strong and you agree. But while escorting, Ragnall shows up and tells you that you shouldn't trust these guys, kill the soldiers. If you choose to trust him and defeat them, he reveals that there was a plot to draw you specifically out on your own into the wilds by Deza. And so he helped you out. But throughout this, he warns you that he might end up on the wrong side of you in the future, and he kind of looks forward to having a 1v1 with us. This obviously pays off in the main story if you did this side quest stuff with him. He escorts Phasus to the tower where everything ends in the main story. And after doing the side quest, he'll challenge you to that 1v1 before you can do the final event of the game. You get to have a 1v1 him and if you defeat him, you'll just kill him. And upon doing so, he calls out that it was a rotten life and he's not sorry to die. Which is pretty dark, again, considering how chipper he is generally. I did feel guilty about this and I used a wake stone to revive him and nothing special happened. He just exclaimed that, ooh, you got him and that's it. Thankfully, something much more interesting happens if you choose to not fight him here. If you intentionally do nothing, not attacking him, but hold him off for two full minutes, if you do that, you'll trigger an entirely new unique cinematic. He sees that your heart is not in it. He sees that you won't fight him for real and that really disappoints him, but he seems to really understand. He references the fact that so much is on the line that, you know, he shouldn't be doing this and clearly you're not actually focused. So instead, he gives you the key to the tower and even leaves you with 20k and the item that you would have got if you beat him normally. So I think this is just a really nice detail. Completely unexpected, but appreciated. It gives you a way to not have to kill your friend and gives him a cool little send off instead. Okay, so next up, you might have noticed that I've been wearing some heavy armor, even though I'm using a bow. And that's because I'm currently in a warfarer vocation. Why I'm doing that is because we're following up from something I highlighted last time. I talked about how you can change some universal armors based on the vocation you're currently playing. 
The example I showcased was the Marcher armor, that's just this nice knightly set. When you swap to an archer while wearing it though, one of the gauntlets is removed, and you're left with a little metal van brace to allow for flexible movement of your fingers. Of course, you can actually use the bow. It's neat that the devs went to the trouble to include this subtle detail because, yeah, using a metal gauntlet like that with a bow would just not be very good. It was Raya Riot who explained in the comments that some armors will even have pieces of equipment changes swaps based on the cape that you're currently equipping. So take this armor piece here. We have this interesting, almost bone looking chest piece, this golden circle on the side. You see how that becomes covered when I start to wear this cape in particular. But when I wear this more open one, we can see that the chest actually appears, but that golden circle on my chest is just gone. And it's not that it's obscured, because with this cape, you can see how it's also just been removed from the set. In fact, in this case, we're no longer wearing that interesting kind of bone plating on my chest. That's entirely gone as well. You can see how it comes back again when I'm wearing this kind of half open one. Whereas a cape that's really on my back and on my shoulders, yeah, it exposes the chest piece again but say this pauldron on my right shoulder there, that's completely gone with these capes. If we wear more of a cape that really isn't covering much, we lose, say, that chess piece thing, but then there's that golden circle that's back now on this one. Finally, with a cape that's really just not covering anything, we get the chest, we got the golden circle, we got the really cool shoulder plate. Isn't it cool that the armors, even down to just this specific one, changes in three different ways based on the cape that you're wearing? That's so specific, so subtle, but so cool. But then I'm in a warfarer vocation for a reason too. It was Sanguine Tales who suggested that if I do this in a warfarer, I can easily see the difference in locations. So as I'm an archer or using a bow in this case, you can see that, hey, I'm actually missing a glove. One of my gauntlets is gone. So if I swap to the daggers, you can see that it comes back. In the case of this bigger, heavier armor, you can see that I've got both gauntlets on, but then two big shoulders, heavy shoulders that would weigh me down with a bow. So when I swap to a bow, you can see how that entire right arm no longer is nearly as heavy. It's got a kind of metal van brace. We still have some kind of light shoulder plating there, but it's got these ridges in it that allows for greater mobility as I move my shoulder compared to that big weighty heavy one. It is truly that arm completely different compared to when I'm in this vocation. It's the tiny details, like how you can see on my elbow there, we have this kind of elbow pad protection thing. But when I swap to the range archer, that's completely gone. And yet we keep the kind of gauntlet, which definitely doesn't look as mobile as it should be. So there is some inconsistency there, I guess. In this armor's case, it's just the shoulder that goes away. But you can see how there's a real difference between these armor sets. There's so much subtle detail to think about. Just something I really appreciate and good to get some more examples of in the different ways that it's affected, like the capes. Okay, so moving on. Here's a cool detail to do with the unmoored world and the true ending of the game. So minor spoilers ahead as a warning, but yeah, the true ending. As you likely do know, if you use the Godsbane blade on yourself while riding the dragon, you'll enter the unmoored world as a true ending. In this extra bit of endgame, we have a challenge to save everyone before the clouds move in and consume everything. Part of that involves going to the red lights, the beacons, that when interacted with, they summon this challenging new unique enemy. But did you know that the amount of beacons actually changes based on what you did before even entering the unmoored world? As it turns out, it's all tied to, you know, the giant Talos in that section where it's chasing face. Thanks to Gil in the comments, it was brought up that this fight actually determines if you have three, four or five beacons to overcome in that world. If you defeat the giant before it has a chance to lose the arm because of the defending soldiers with their weapons, you only have to overcome three beacons yourself. If you defeat it post arm lost, then you'll have to deal with four or a total of five maximum is possible if Telos gets all the way to the lava, falling in there and being completely defeated. Basically, in the unmoored world, you go to the Talos body and have your main pawn enter it. From that point, your pawn is controlling it and uses it to defeat those unique enemies that spawn at the beacons. So naturally, if you defeat the Talos faster, you don't let it lose an arm and get all messed up and destroyed. Therefore, the pawn ends up with a more functional fighting Talos to use. This means it can defeat not just one, but maybe two of those unique enemies. Still a very cool detail and awesome to see there's so much variance in the events depending on your success. But there you have it, another set of useful and hopefully interesting things you might not have known. Once again, please do drop comments if you know anything tied to these topics today or maybe something entirely new that would just fit in these videos in general. Hopefully I can keep making videos like this because they are really interesting to do. For now though, I've been Hollow, you've been you. Thanks so much for getting involved and thanks for watching. Josh, Cotton, and Hollow with the videos Dropping the humor like a hammer on your tippy toes Bringing entertainment on a daily arrangement To take our insanity and turn it into entertainment Yes, I said entertainment twice
to reiterate that it is nice to look into your faces on a mostly daily basis when you let us in your homes to make the whole world a stage is uh goodbye <laughs>